Thank you for that. Awesome call to worship there. So welcome everybody to our worship service. Those of you here in the sanctuary, thank you for your uh, physical presence. Those of you joining us online, appreciate you being with us any way that you can. That's This is here for you. Um, and thank you for joining in that way. Just a little preview. We are kicking off our fall stewardship campaign. It's going to be this week, next week, and October 23rd. And on the 23rd, uh, next Sunday, you'll be given some pledge cards to take home and pray about your giving for next year. And then you can bring those back on the 23rd. Uh, we use those to kind of help set, to help us guide us on things like budget and things like that. So heads up on that. That's kicking off today, stewardship campaign. And uh, we'll have choir singing some pieces, a piece later on, I think. Or no, Jim. Jim's singing a piece later on. Is that right? Jim? And the choir and Jim. There we go. And the accompaniments. Of course, it's going to be amazing. And our liturgist for today is Billy Wentzman, so Billy will kick us off with our gathering words. Welcome, O oh hopeful ones. <coughs> Come to, to, to his presence. God is the divine shield for us. May our hearts love and joy. God meet us here. All right, at this time, we'll open up the floor for the sharing of joys and concerns. If you have either one of those, please raise your hand, and I'll come around with the microphone. And uh, once you have the microphone, just uh, share your name and then whatever you're comfortable sharing. Susie Paulson and uh, our 
friend Mary uh, Fordyce is doing very poorly, and she's asking for for prayers. She's she's feeling like she's going downhill rapidly, and she needs our support and our prayers. Pat I'm Gardner. Many of you remember Irene Ross, who's been a member of this church forever. Um, she's been moved to Hospice House in Coeur d'Alene uh, this past week and is failing fast, too. Hi, this Tuesday, it is mom's birthday, the 11th. She'll be 63. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> All right. Let me check the live stream here, chat, and see if... All right, nothing there. All right, if you would please join me in a pastoral prayer, then all together for a version of the Lord's Prayer. God, we come before you. We lift up to you our joys and our concerns. God, we are grateful that we have a community, this connection where we can share with each other our burdens and our joys and celebrations. God, we lift up to you now those we've specifically named here. Lord, we pray for Mary. We pray for her health. We pray for, um, Lord, just strength and wisdom uh, at this time. We pray that uh, we would um, uh, surround Mary with uh, love and uh, care and concern and, and visits and, and uh, good things, God. We also pray for Irene as well as she's moved into hospice care. We lift her up to you. We pray for her family and her friends around her. Um, and Lord, just that she'd be aware of your presence uh, on this part of her journey. God, we are thankful for, uh, we're thankful for Billy and her birthday coming up here on Tuesday. Lord, we celebrate um, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, we celebrate the year that uh, she had and we look forward to more. And God, all those who uh, maybe didn't feel like sharing, didn't express any joys or concerns, Lord, you know that each and every one of us carry with us uh, both of those things, probably at all times. So God, we lift those up to you and pray that you'd work in and through our lives and in through our situations. God, we thank you for your presence, for your wisdom, for your strength that we can rely on. And now, God, we come together as one voice to offer up a version of the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, God, lover of us all, most holy one, help us to respond to you, to create what you want for us here on earth. Give us today enough for our needs. Forgive our weak and deliberate offenses, just as we must forgive others when they hurt us. Help us to resist evil and to do what is good, for we are yours, endowed with your power to make our world whole. Amen. My brother, not my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. Hallelujah, Lord. It's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. Not the preacher, not the deacon, but it's me, 
Scripture reading for today is Luke 16, 19 through 31, MSG, The Rich Man and Lazarus. There once was a rich man, expensively dressed in the latest fashions, wasting his days in the conspicuous consumption. A poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, had been dumped on his doorstep. All he lived for was to get a meal from scraps of the rich man's table. His best friends were the dogs who came and licked his sores. Then he died, this poor man, and was taken up by the angels to the lap of Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried in hell and in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham in the distance and Lazarus in his lap. He called out, Father, Abraham, mercy, have mercy. Send Lazarus to dip his fingers in water to cool my tongue. I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham said, Child, remember that in your lifetime you got the good things and Lazarus had the bad things. It's not like that here. Here he's consoled and you're tormented. Besides, in all these matters, there is a huge chasm set between us so that no one can go from us to you even if he wanted to nor can anyone cross over from you to us. The rich man said, Then let me ask you, Father, send him to the house of my father, where I have five brothers, so he can tell them the score and warn them, so they won't end up here in this place of torment. Abraham answered, They have Moses and the prophets to tell them the score. Let them listen to them. I know Father Abraham, he said, but they're not listening. If someone came back to them from the dead, they would change their ways. Abraham replied, If they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they're not going to be convinced by someone who rises from the dead. All right. Good morning, everybody. We are right here. It's fall time. I don't know if you're all feeling it at home. Do you feel it? Did you have to, anyone have to bump their heat up yet? Anyone crank it up a little bit overnight? Not yet. Holding out. We got people, got some diehards here, huh, that are hanging on to it. All right. Well, uh, over at, uh, at our house, we, it's definitely fall because they've set up the pumpkin patch uh, all around our house, so I can't I can't pretend it's not fall anymore. It's out there. It's at my door, knocking on my door practically. So there it is. Um, and fall brings with it, of course, a time where we're going to talk about our stewardship campaign. That's right. We're talking about, we're going to talk about uh, giving and resources and talents and money and time and relationships and all those good kinds of things. Um, the uh, the season here it just is full of reminders for me, right, that we're about to embark into a whole slew of things coming up. When you hear, you feel the 
cold air sinking in. You see some leaves starting to change just a little bit here and there. You start to think, okay, here's what we got coming up. We've got Halloween just around the corner. We've got Thanksgiving coming up. We've got Christmas, and we've got all that time in between to go to the parties and functions and all of those things. Some of us get happy, right, during this time of year with these reminders. Others of us are a little bit stressed already about, you know, like there's no, there's no time left for anything. The year's almost over. Um, but these are reminders that we notice that speak to us about what this time of year is. And today in our scripture reading that Billy read for us, it's all about noticing. It's all about paying attention. Uh, this parable that you've no doubt heard I am sure hundreds if not thousands of times in your life maybe from if you were in church for your whole life you probably heard it from when you were uh, uh, knee high to a grasshopper is that what they used to say back then right all the way on up to today and I want to remind you speaking of reminders that this is a parable let's begin there first and foremost this is not meant to be taking taken 100% literally And I've been in churches and and heard preachers who've talked about it and constructed whole uh, views about what the afterlife is like based on this parable alone. You know, like where, even down to the details of like where hell is in uh, place to heaven, they must be, you know, right next to each other, all these things. I don't think Jesus was engaging here with a literal teaching about what hell will be like. I think he was using a tool in his storytelling tool belt called exaggeration to really drive home a point to get people to notice and pay attention to something so this parable that jesus tells uh the pharisees is who he he's talking to at this point uh, the parable of the rich man and lazarus it really is about noticing things it's about not passing by repeatedly that which really should stand out for us it's an extreme example jesus uses extreme examples here so um, how many of you here, oh, let's say driving home uh, to your home, you would notice if somebody painted their house a brand new color on your usual route. Would you notice? Would you pay attention? Yes, absolutely. You would notice. Now, let's say they've painted their, I don't know, let's, yeah, let's say they painted it Pepto-Bismol pink, you know, like you would notice that, right? It would stand out to you. But what if A year from now, you've driven by it every day. Do you notice it anymore? In fact, you might even catch yourself thinking, wait a minute, is it still even pink anymore? I don't even notice. I I haven't paid attention. I forget to to notice. Jesus here in this, basically in the story, is letting it be known that there are things that we get used to, even extreme things, that we don't even pay attention to or notice anymore. So it begins with this rich man. He dresses in the finest clothes available. He eats whatever he wants and however much he wants every day. Uh, we would say, you know, in today's language, we would say he's the, you know, the 1%, the, the top 1% of the 1%, we would say. And then there's Lazarus. Lazarus in this story is that bright pink house that uh, the rich man doesn't even notice anymore. Right off the bat, there's something noteworthy here to begin with. No other character in any one of Jesus' parables ever gets a name. This is the only parable where Jesus gives a name to the character. So there's already something kind of noteworthy here. No other character in any parable gets a name. Not even the rich man in this parable gets a name. Lazarus happens to mean, of all things, in Hebrew, God helps. We're in Aramaic. God helps. That's literally what it means. He's the bottom 1%. And with this character, Lazarus, Jesus really piles on the details. He goes to the extreme to get you to really pay attention to this character. In fact, it's even kind of gross, some of the details he uses. Uh, So we begin, one of the details he makes sure they notice, um, in that day and age, you know, there weren't napkins, there weren't things to wipe your mouth with, and so I've heard, this might be true, that... um, that uh, folks would dab their mouths with bread. With, that's what the piece of bread was for, was to clean their mouth. So the bread was like a napkin for them, and they, they could eat it if they wanted or just kind of set it aside or discard it. And so what's going on here is Lazarus is just even begging 
just for their used napkins off their table, basically. Like, what, are, what you use to clean your mouth with. If I could just get a bite of half-chewed piece of food, you know, he would be satisfied. That's what he wants, just something like that to eat. And then, Jesus gives a description of these open wounds all over his body, all over his skin. Every day, right there in front of the rich man's house, right where his friends left him. Lazarus' friends had dumped him off. The mangy street dogs come, his only companions every day. And they come and they lick his wounds, you know, maybe even expecting him to, to die. I, I, the wounds, they're just a nasty description, you know, of, of what's going on. And this poor Lazarus, he's too weak to even chew them away. And that's Lazarus' day. Lying at the rich man's gate, dreaming about scraps of slobbery bread, well, dogs come and lick his wounds. It's a really, really a sad picture. It's a sad sight. Except the rich man doesn't even seem to see it. And if he does see it, he doesn't see this situation for what it is. Or rather, he doesn't see Lazarus for who Lazarus is. Someone God helps. And therefore, Lazarus is an opportunity for this rich man to practice compassion, but he doesn't see it. And of course, the real action comes, the real interesting action takes place after the two men have died. Lazarus is whisked away by the angels, taken to, um, you know, be uh, by Abraham's side. It's even in, in Hebrew, it's, or in Aramaic, or the idea that they've passed down is more along the lines of like Abraham's bosom being held, you know, closely to uh, Father Abraham, just comforted. And the rich man goes down to uh, Hades, down to hell. hell in, in Greek, it's Hades, uh, where he suffers, you know, extreme heat. Like it's, you know, imagine uh, Elsie Valley, and uh, it's a, you know, 107-degree day, but the heat index makes it closer to 120. You know, it's kind of like that, right? W and, and you don't have a water bottle. It might, in fact, it might even be worse than that, you know, going on here. And for the first time in this story, suddenly, the rich man notices Lazarus. Now he sees him. Now he's paying attention to him. He notices Lazarus, even though he's far away. And he notices him because Lazarus now has something that he wants. Right? Abraham and the rich man go back and forth over just the request for a little drop of water. Until finally the rich man thinks of someone besides himself for a change and has moved to ask for a request for his brother who are maybe headed for the same situation he is. And Jesus' parable ends with an intriguing bit of foreshadowing here. Those who aren't paying attention to God's word, Moses and the prophets, they won't notice, if they, if they don't see in God's word God's care and concern for the downtrodden, for the impoverished. If they can't see that God desires mercy for your neighbor who's in dire circumstances, if they don't pay attention all throughout Scripture where it's listed and written large for them to see, they won't even notice if someone were to rise from the dead. A little foreshadowing here, right? Talking an obvious illusion to Jesus coming back from the dead. Now again, Jesus never intends for this to be a literal description of what happens to people when they die. And he's not trying to teach here, you know, hey, if you just do some good deeds, you know, in your life, all will be taken care of and all will be well. These are exaggerated folklore type features that Jesus has added in to this parable that Jesus is telling. Over the top elements to surprise people, to warn people. Jesus has added them in so that the Pharisees and anyone else who is listening will understand that a great reversal is taking place. With Jesus, the entire world is going to be turned upside down, upended. And it's high time for people to notice, Jesus says, that the kind of people God has decided to help are these people the kind of situations God has chosen to get involved in. Now, there are two lessons here that I can see pretty plainly in this passage of Scripture. 
The one is very obvious, and it's one you've probably heard every time you hear this parable. You've heard it a thousand times. It's an easy one to catch. Pretty simply, we should notice the people who need compassion. We should pay attention to those who are sitting outside the gates, desperate for some help. We should be moved to action to care for and have concern for people who are downtrodden, overlooked, chewed up and spit out by the system. That's lesson number one. And that is an obvious, easy one to see. And in fact, I have to be quite honest with you, in the United Methodist Church, you know, the entire denomination was built upon this type of action. The things that the dom- denomination does is um, commendable for the acts of mercy and kindness and compassion and justice that this denomination has been built on. From the United Methodist Women, now called United Women in Faith, and the incredible acts of service and ministry and justice and all those things that they do, to UMCOR, the Committee on Response, the wonderful, incredible things that that organization does through us and our giving to respond to people in need and who need it. So if I stand here and I leave this at this lesson, I will only feel like I have preached to the choir because we get this. We understand this. This is an easy one. We try to do this. And so I want to attach a second lesson to this, one that maybe isn't as obvious as that first one. But that lesson is this. Lazarus is not the only person suffering in this parable. There's another person suffering too. It's the rich man. And I'm not talking about someday when in the parable he goes down, you know, goes to hell and he's experiencing torture and torment. I would submit to you that one of the points of Jesus' parable isn't that it's just suffering someday after this life. I submit to you that Jesus was describing the rich man's current state of affairs. The rich man is suffering right now from a chasm being created in his life right now that separates him and disconnects him from his community. You see, sometimes in our rush to help the downtrodden and the impoverished, as we should, we sometimes turn a blind eye and we don't notice that there are other people in this world who need help too. They need help learning that it is okay to be a part of a community and not isolated from the rest of the world by this chasm of greed and wealth. This rich man needs help too. He needs someone to offer him hope that his isolation won't continue to grow and widen and deepen if someone will reach out to him and connect with him and show him there's a community here for you that needs you and you need it too. He needs someone to offer him hope. Now, of course, listen, it's his own fault that the chasm is there. Of course, he built it. His choices led him to this spot. If only he had made better choices, this chasm wouldn't exist. All true. But doesn't that sound very similar to how people often talk about those in poverty? Listen, (laughs) church, what if our job isn't to focus on fault and blame and guilt and why people are in the positions they are in, either poverty or closed off because of their bad choices with wealth? What if instead our job is to leverage our resources and our gifts and our times to help heal and close that chasm chasm, and bring people together who need each other? What if we are called to build a community of restoration and connection? Aren't we called a connectional church? Isn't that the United Methodist system? Connecting people together? You see, in the first century, right after Jesus' death, resurrection, and when he left, the church was all about, here's what we can do that's different than everybody else. We can make a table, 
and we can invite everybody to that table, the poor and the rich. And we can bring them together and build a community where we learn from and help each other because we all need each other. We can turn our blind eye to people in poverty, but we can also turn our blind eye to people who we think don't need any help. They need it too. They need a community that will teach them compassion, connection, community, and humility to learn. I need that rich man. I need Lazarus as much as he needs me so that I don't fall into this hell that I'm building, <laughs> separated from people by selfishness, greed, and uh, pride. This chasm between us calls for a Christian witness to a different way of life, a way of living that reaches both those with and those without to build a community together, a, 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 a society that the world uh, will look at and maybe learn from and change. You and I are called. Maybe the question for us is, is God calling us with our time and our resources and our abilities to bring together those who are separating themselves from the rest of the world? Who are we looking past? This is our question. Who are we looking past in our day-to-day -day lives? What ministry are we missing out on as we rush by or past? What opportunity do we have to make a difference right here in this valley that will require more than we've ever considered before? Uh, more generosity, more stewardship, but also radical hospitality to welcome those who we've never thought to welcome before. What if we became a place that facilitated these connections between people who need each other. Uh, this could be life-changing stuff right here in this valley, don't you think? I think so. What we today, what we need might be compassion for Lazarus and compassion for those suffering from their own greed and uh, unhealthy living to connect together in Christian community in a way that others maybe have never thought of or seen before. Amen? Let's pray. God, as we consider our times and our talents, our resources, individually and as a church, God, I pray that we would consider how we can use all of those things to be... Um, stewards of those things in a way that builds connections between the haves and the have-nots, two people, two sets of people who are in desperate need of connection and community. God, my prayer is that we would use all of our resources to facilitate that connection, that community. Lord God, that we would be a church of the open table where everyone has a seat and we all need each other. I pray for that, God. And in Jesus' name, we, we ask all of this. Amen. All right, let me uh, mention our offering real quick if you're joining us online. And of course, if you're here in person, Doug's going to come around with uh, an offering plate, Doug and Bob. And if you have something to give, go ahead and raise your hand and they'll come around. If you're joining us online, you can give to either congregation, whichever one you're connected to, in, in these ways. You can mail a check in. Those are the addresses there. That's an easy way to do it. Or you can drop them off at either office. Just call ahead, make sure somebody's in the office for, the, for that day. Both churches also have ways to give online. So for the Clarkson Church, you just go over to that big green button on the right-hand side, click that, and set up your giving that way. For the Lewiston Church, there's a Contact Us uh, button over on the right-hand side. Click that, and then find the Donate tab there and give uh, that way. Both churches also have mobile apps, so if you uh, have a smartphone, you can just put one of these on your uh, smartphone, and then when you uh, remember to give, you can just pull it up. So for the Clarkson Church, it's the Tithely app, T-I-T-H-E dot L-Y. Download that, search for Clarkson UMC, and you can give through that app. 
or for Lewiston, it's the Vanco Mobile Giving app. You'll want to search for the First United Methodist Church and then use the one in Lewiston, Idaho. Now, a special giving focus for this month, uh, well, at least for today. There'll probably be a different one next week. Um, the, uh, we want to uh, bring up the Right Hand Fund. This is my pastoral discretion fund that I use from both churches. Both churches give into it, and I help people with things like gas, if they're needing gas to get to jobs or job interviews, uh, bills that might need uh, uh, some help, uh, hotel stays, if there's a situation they're in where they don't have a home or can't go to their home, might not be safe, so I use uh, that for that, uh, that, and then groceries, things like that. So if you want to give to that, if you have a check, you can just, in the memo, put right hand fun. Sheena knows what to do in the uh, office, so does Terry. Or, you know, maybe an envelope, just note, right hand fun. As always, we thank you so much for your generosity and all the ways that you, uh, that we minister uh, in the name of this church and the Clarkston Church through your uh, generous giving. So thank you so much for that. Let me say a prayer for our offering, and then uh, we'll move to our closing song. God, we thank you so much for the offerings that will be given today. Lord, we pray a blessings upon it that uh, these offerings might be used as seeds to plant and grow this beloved community that you desire, these connections that you desire for us, bringing together people uh, who maybe we turn blind eyes to. God, we pray that we would use these resources to connect to um, many people. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, our closing song is hymn number 451. be seated just a few announcements really quickly I'll uh, let if anyone has any out here of course but uh, I'm just giving you a heads up we have an advent book study coming very soon I've already got the book picked I'm not giving you the details because here's why I do this it's not going to start until the end of November first Sunday but I know uh, there are people in our book study groups I tell them they're going to get it now and they're going to get it all done before the book study because it's just a four-week book type deal so I'm holding off a little bit. Nobody jumping ahead, okay? No, no jumping the gun here, all right? But I will, I promise, by the end of this month, give you the exact details so you have a little time to get, to, to, to get some shipping in, in there too. Uh, but it's going to be good. It's going to be a really interesting book study, I think. Or, you know, it might just be more of the same that you've ever heard about Advent. But, you know, it's interesting and new to me, so all right. And um, let's see, what else we got going on? Audio, visual, if you ever need any recordings of any sermon, special song, 
uh, any uh, children's moment, anything like that, let us know. We'll make sure you get that. And I had a sticky note, but I think I left it at home, of upcoming dates for David Walker. Uh, he's in a play at Silverthorne, and he wants to get that information out, but I'll share it next week with you. It's at the end of this month, coming up pretty quick. All right, any other announcements we need to know about? Yeah, men's coffee, Wednesday, 9.30. Anything else? Yeah, here we go. Let's, we got something here. All right. We are co-hosting with the um, Nazarene Church for Family Promise the end of October through that first week in November. And I will have the sign-up sheet during coffee hour. Um, if you're listening and watching online, please give me a call if you would like to sign up to either be an overnight host or a dinner host. And my number's in the church directory, but if you don't have it, it's 208-413-2954. All right, thank you. Oh, goodness. Thank you for that. Other announcements? Yeah, I'll get it. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just don't let me step on it. That's all that matters. Okay, all right. Let me set you off with a benediction. And, oh, no, the choral benediction first. Thank you, Chris. Chris gave me a little ahem. <laughs> Okay, let me send you off with a benediction as well. This week, may you spread God's grace and love everywhere you step. May you have open eyes to notice those you may have overlooked in the past. And may you see the ways that you can help bring God's beloved community here on earth. Peace be with you. <laughs>